Yeah, you know what it is, ladies and gentlemen. Real late, hot 97. And uh, I'm very, very I'm pleased today, man, because we have one of my favorite artists uh, of the last several years, Kendrick Lamar in the building. Last several years. Last That's several years. Big. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I will get into that in a second. We also got Schoolboy Q in the building. Yeah. Hey, Q. West Sia Falia Nia. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, are, you are in a blessed position these days, man, of being one of the few dudes who does real hip-hop music that is actually getting buzz. Yeah. What the hell did you do? What kind of deal with the devil did you make oh, to be man. able to make good music and actually be getting attention for it? Man, you know, it's just trial and error. You know, I've been doing this, you know, for a while, since I was like 17, I've been in the studio, and um, I made the mistakes, you know, that uh, an artist that had no vision, you know, will make, which would try to compromise with what everybody else is doing and take a whole bunch of label meetings, you know, and, and you know, Doing, doing the, the the cliche thing to do is which is make the records that they want and then. So you made some of those records yeah. at first when you were K Dot. Yeah, is this the yeah. K Dot days? Come on, too many. The records that I make that I make now, I had those in the cut and I was you know didn't want to want to play those for people because I felt like it wasn't a trend. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, they're not gonna like these records. Yeah, exactly. So I was falling right into that little hole where, you know, I wasn't being in the creative space, you know, to to express myself the way I felt and. At the end of the day, it didn't work, so I felt like I had to do something else. So did something happen, or did it just not work? So you started going more indie, and the more you went on your own, the more success you started having because you were just doing you. What, what happened was that shit just wasn't working. You know what I mean? And, and at the end of the day, the same thing, I, I didn't have... I, it just didn't feel right, you know, because I couldn't express myself the way I had a lot to talk about, you know, as a, as a kid, even doing music. And um, I just woke up one morning and said, you know what? Some got to give. I got to flip it up, you know, and get these thoughts out the way that I hear them in my head and not what the radio is feeding in my head. You know, radio records, you know, that's that's a different world. I ain't dissing it or whatnot, but at the same time, it needs a balance. No one's allowed to diss it anymore. You can diss it. You're on the radio. You can still diss it, man. I hate the regular rotation. It yeah, just hurts. You know, it have a few good records on there. But it still need that balance where I feel like everything do not have to sound the same, you know, and that's just my opinion. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people get get it twisted because they look back in history and they'll think like, oh, you know, back in the day it was all tribe and but like, no, it wasn't like that. No one, no one's delusional enough to think that there was a time when the radio played nothing but good music and hip hop. That really wasn't true. It, it was mostly at night that you would hear those good records. But the difference was then was there was more balance. Exactly. There weren't as many whack records. And the wackest records then you listen to now and like, damn, those were actually, yeah. those sound like straight out of Compton compared to what I'm hearing on the radio yeah. now. You know, it's, it's about a dollar at the end of the day. You know, my little brother, he can't rap worth a lick, but he make a hot song in his bedroom right now and he get the buzz. <laughs> it's going to go on the radio and it's going to get the attention. This is what brings about an interesting relationship of yours. Mm -hmm. I have to say I was excited and concerned when I heard about you touring with Drake. Yeah. I was like, that's dope, that's dope. And I was like, well, I hope it doesn't hang with Drake too hard because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Drake is a dude who um, the space he's in musically right now, you know, it's cool. There's a place for it. But Drake isn't exactly doing what we thought he would, what many of nerdy backpackers like myself yeah. thought he might be doing a few years ago. Right. And I won't lie, definitely crossed my mind. I was like, damn, I hope... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kendrick doesn't get co-opted by the radio scene that Drake is caught up in right now. So how do you balance having a relationship and touring with someone when musically you're really in a kind of a different space than Drake is in? Yeah, at the end of the day, it goes back to what I said the first time. I got to have a vision. You know, me being 17 or 19 years ago, I'd have easily been manipulated, you know, by being on stage with a person that sold millions, you know, or in front of millions and sold millions of records, you know, every night. And, um, Seeing, seeing people, seeing that crowd, that sea of people, I'd have easily, you know, try to transcend what I was doing and compromise what he was doing. Because there had to be nights when you got on stage before him, and obviously I know every night you rocked, I'm sure there were people who came out for you, uh -huh. but I'm sure a larger part of that audience oh, was yeah. for Drake, and there were nights when you were out there doing your songs, and cats weren't reacting the yeah. same way they would be if you were doing something that was much friendlier to them. Definitely. Um, you have to have some confidence. That's a to... challenge within itself. Right. And I already knew I was going to with, you know, go into the situation and being able to challenge myself because I'm used to doing you know, a crowd of 3,000. And this, this was no radio, no album, or no promotion. So I'm figuring you know, that, that's good for me. 
you know, in the, in the world that I'm in as an artist. And um, when you put up against 10,000 people, you already got to be prepared mentally to know what you're up against. You got to have nothing but confidence and, and to win over at least 10 people at a, at a time at a show. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to get everybody. But if I figure if I'm doing 30 shows with this dude and I can win over uh, at least 100, you know, that's a, a, a bigger stepping for me and my company. So that's how I look at it. My brother-in-law, Connor, I told him I was talking to you and he almost made a mess of himself. I mean, this is, this is a dude who hit me three days ago and was like, yo, schoolboy Q is insane. It's like there are dudes who are fans of you guys, yeah. like really would see you and go crazy. Yep. And then the next minute, there are people who are like, who the F are you? Yeah. You're still in that space. It's a of- crazy world. We were just talking about this yesterday. It's like... Uh, um, a, a famous world in the uh, in the underground scene. Yep, but it's like tilting over where nobody in the the mainstream will know who the fuck you are. Welcome to my life. Yeah, it's a crazy feeling. <laughs> no, believe me, I know. I'm at an underground hip hop show and people are like, "Oh, Peter Rosenberg, can you do this?" Can you do? Yeah. I'm like, "Oh man, I'm important." Yeah. And then I'm at some mainstream stuff and it's like, uh, "Are you on the list, sir? What's you know?" It's just uh, yeah. it's just a crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, this is the world that. Yeah, we signed up to really want to be exactly. influential in. Exactly. So that's it's more important. Frankly, it feels really good to have hip hop heads love what you yeah. do. You know, even though there's some days when you're like, "Damn, I just wish some more chicks would yell." But <laughs> my fiance is happy that only dudes want to come talk to me. So, <laughs> what was your dream with Tupac, and how did that affect you? Oh uh, man, it was just you know one of them the delir- delirious nights. You know, when you jumping in, not your sleep, and um, I, I felt the energy, man. I just had a visual, man, and you know. Uh, strange sound you know in my ear saying you know don't let the music die and um i always knew what i had to do you know as far as you know when i talk about my music but that right there just confirmed it you know that that was that man's words my birthday is the day after dude you know so i don't think it's really no coincidence that i gotta you know continue to talk about what i talk about and um yeah I jumped into the studio that next day, man, and I did a whole bunch of records. You've been co-signed by a lot of cats on the West Coast as, like, the prince of the West Coast. Yeah. But there's a lot of cats who stylistically you have some things in common with, but in other ways you're very different. Yeah. On any level, are you surprised by the embracing that you get by a game, a snoop, et cetera, by fans in general? Like, there just aren't a lot of cats out there who are new, yeah. who talk about real stuff, who get embraced. Has it surprised you at all? It hasn't surprised me because, you know, I paid these dudes the utmost respect, you know, not only on the level of listening to their music, but the, on the level of studying their music, you know what I mean? So I feel that I well deserve it because I'm the kid that, that, you know, hung around at house parties and, and really critiqued these videos and looked these videos like, man, these is heroes to me. Mm-hmm. You dig know what I'm saying? So for them to come back full circle and embrace me, you know, that just shows you, man, that it's, it's powerful when you, vision something you know as a kid and you constantly think about it and it comes back full circle and, and you know give you the gratitude that's well deserved so i don't i don't downplay that at all man i'm proud of that you know that them cats on stage and be able to you know you know uh, respect my music so you took the rap nerd thing pretty serious like this was always what you were about it was a always what i was about when i turned about like 16 but subconsciously it always been there because I was the kid that was always reciting, you know, the, the the music around my cousins, trying to act like them, you know, not knowing that one day it was going to eventually, you know, pin me to writing my own rhymes and shit. So, but who who are your favorites, favorite artists growing up? My favorite, and I know you, and you can hear the East Coast influence in you too. So I'm curious to hear East Coast cast that you love as well. You know what's crazy, but I I ain't started listening to East Coast music, you know, to um, DMX first album. Wow. Yeah, DMX first album. That's what got me writing my own music. So that, but but that makes sense. What are you, twenty four? Yeah. So it makes sense that that would be the. Yeah, I was thirteen. I never. That's the it. time. Uh, that album drop. I swear, my my homeboy Antonio put that album in my hand. I went back home, popped it in. I started writing raps just immediately, and before that, I was straight West Coast, you know, and and it's crazy because, um, I was just a, a kid, ignorance bliss. I was just going with the flow of you know. Uh, what my older cousin was rapping about, I mean, was listening to. So I didn't pay attention, you know, to, to greats like Biggie because I was caught up in all that, you know, truth be told. We all was. Oh, no, you were West Side for life. Yeah, definitely. That was it. Yep. So um, what happened was 
Pac passed, DMX came out, and I felt that same type of energy that, you know, Pac had in the game. So I think that's what made me start writing. And uh, when I heard DMX, I heard Jay-Z. Boom, I started getting on some Jay-Z tilt real heavy. Heard Jay-Z, people was telling me like, yo, go back and listen to big stuff. I was like, all right, cause this shit sounding crazy right now. Went back to big stuff, and I was like, oh, this is what they was talking about. You know what I'm saying? So after having years of a West Coast influence, and then you turn a, a, a teenager, and you start doing your own thing, doubling back all the way, you just combine all these these flavors into one and you develop yourself and that's what happened. And from Biggie, I'm guessing to Nas, to yep. you reference Tribe. Yeah. You so everything. You went all the way. Yep. Like have you listened to De La? Yeah. Have you been through everything? You know, records like them was the records that my pops was playing in the house anyway. That's crazy. How old's your pops? My pops is what, fifty now. That's 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 so fortunate that you had a pops who was listening to. Yeah. Dope hip hop. By the way, respect the Wu-Tang sweatshirt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Off top. You're going to be a hot 97. You might as well. Right. <laughs> How are you doing, schoolboy Q? Chilling, man. Tired. <laughs> um, okay, listen. I have a I have a bone to pick with you. Did your management tell you that I had a bone to pick with you? Yeah, they told me. All right. So I'm curious. Um, I was pretty upset. Uh, my brother-in-law was killed in a drunk driving accident uh -huh. in May. And I did this PSA last week, like a week and a half ago, about rappers endorsing drunk, drinking and driving. Because, you know, and a lot of people jumped on my case. I'm like, oh, Rosenberg, that's the only thing you care about is drinking and driving because it affected you. And I said, well, there's a lot of things that people say about gun violence that I also have a problem with. Mm -hmm. But you can also make the case that in a lot of people's imagery that involves guns, et cetera, is a story. It's fictional. We know rappers aren't murderers, right, for the most part. We know rappers aren't killers. It's a story they're telling. Yeah. But there's something troubling about mentioning drinking and driving because it can be real. And then you, and then literally the week after I put, I, I talked about this, you dropped a song. Coincidentally, I know, you dropped a song called "Hands on the Wheel" with ASAP Rocky. Yeah. Clearly, on some level, endorsing. I'm sure you didn't maybe see it in your eyes like that, but I'm, when I saw it, endorsing drinking and driving. And as someone whose family was so deeply affected by it, I'm curious to what you'd say about. Whether you think that has an impact on people, whether you think it's a wise decision to put out a song like that, that on some level to kids will endorse drinking and driving. All I could really say is sorry. Um, I didn't mean it in no way to where, I, you know, but I know I am, I do have an influence on kids and everything, but I don't know. I talk about game banging too, and people die from game banging every day. You know what I mean? And plus, the hands on the wheel thing goes with the title of the album, Habits of Contradiction. It's part of habits, you know what I mean? So it's not necessarily something that you think is a good thing. It's a habit of contradiction. Yes. It's not really, it's not, it's not, I didn't mean it in, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't mean it in that way. It's, it's part of the album. Mm -hmm. Habits and contradictions and fits in the album, letting you know about me. Because it's a prequel to setbacks, you know what I mean? When you have bad habits and you contradict yourself, it gives you setbacks. So I put it in there to let them know that this is the reason why I have setbacks. You get what I'm saying? It's because of habits like that. Yes. The thing is, I figure with someone who I've heard such positive things about that there would probably be a meaning to it that's deeper. But then even me, I'm a pretty smart, I consider myself a pretty smart hip-hop fan. And so I went and watched it a couple times to be like, I don't want to take this out of context. But if you, but let's be realistic. A lot of people's context is just that three-minute video. Yeah. You know, there are some people who are going to follow all your stuff and be like, oh, perfect. But the average douchebag 18 year old who listens to hip hop not I don't mean douchebag in a literal sense but like you know all kids are douchebags to an extent mm. you know what I'm saying and they hear it like I just think they couldn't imagine how much those cosigns go because I know as a stupid kid myself who loved what rappers did every time I tried smoking weed every little thing I did was definitely influenced by the rappers who I grew up on and that may sound weak and stupid but it's real man and these kids already look up to you. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I really do believe that. And I promised myself that when I saw artists who did something that I thought was questionable in my eyes, I would bring it up, whether it's you or Kanye or Luda or anyone else. And yes, it is a personal issue to me personally because I had a personal tragedy of, that affected me. But I'll be honest with you, I've always been, if you listen to my show, you know I'm anti-whack music and whack messages in general. But I'm glad we had that conversation. I'm glad you were able to explain a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I'm and sorry we, too, and I do and I do appreciate yeah, that. For your loss. Um, well, listen, man. Best of luck to both you guys. I'm I'm excited to hear everything you got. Q, you dro just dropped a joint. Yeah. What's the name of your joint that's out right now? Habits and Contradictions is out on iTunes right now. Go get that. Yeah.
So so check out Schoolboy Q. I'm glad we talked. Thank and Kendrick, thank you guys. I hope I get you guys on the next mixtape. We'll get you guys both on a joint okay. together. It's done deal. Yeah.